Welcome to another Reloop Innovation Series episode. And of course, this time we would like to talk a little bit about something which Reloop has been invested in for quite some time now, and that is, of course, uh, best in class deposit return systems. Uh, now, this is a concept which might be slightly unfamiliar to some people. What do we mean by best in class for a deposit return system? Well, best in class really um, means the greatest way in which we can deploy a best, uh, deposit return system. And best in class is the ensemble of key elements of a deposit return that we, from experience, have deemed to be best in class. So it's a whole suite of key parts of a program that combined make a best in class. And that's why we're talking about it, because we want to make sure that as governments embark on new deposit return systems all over the world, as they are, they can base their new systems on what we already know are elements of best in class. All right, thank you. And what determines whether something is best in class or not? Well, we typically look at um, what, how well the system performs. So in this case, when we're looking at performance, we're looking at, of all the beverage containers sold, what's the recovery rate? What's the collection rate? Are we getting at least nine out of 10 back? And if we're getting nine out of 10 back, then certainly that is a marker of best in class. We're looking at the costs of the program and hoping that we can make sure they are the lowest possible cost per unit at the highest possible performance, which is good for the brand owners who are ultimately the ones that are paying for those net costs. But we're also looking at simplicity, the ability for consumers that are paying the deposit to be the very same consumers that are getting their deposit back, that everybody has access to getting their deposit back. That's also another key element of deposit return best in class that we're looking at. So it's a combination of many things, but ultimately it's about effectiveness and efficiency of the system, one that everybody can participate in. What about, uh, what about another, another aspect which uh, at Reloop we've been uh, investigating for quite some time, and that is of course uh, the so-called R2R, return to retail, return to retailer uh, model. Um, in what, what ways is this important? Is this just simply a question of convenience, or do, or do other, other stakeholders manage to, uh, other stakeholders, are they going to benefit from this in any way? Well, the return to retail model has typically been uh, introduced and it is wide scale around Europe. It is the return to retail model where we're asking retailers to take a role. They have a central role in the distribution of these products, so they should also have a central role in taking them back. And one of the reasons we do return to retail is because it's extremely conven convenient for consumers because they can literally just take the bottles and cans back when they go shopping again. But it's also from a it's also cheaper from a total system cost perspective because you're using existing retail space or right, out, right outside of the front door of the retailer like we would see, for example, in Lithuania. That's existing space where we don't have to create a whole new collection point somewhere else and pay full costs in terms of not having marginal costs but having full costs. You know, insurance, lighting, heating, uh, all of these things when you're in the retail environment you just piggyback on what's already existing and it's easy. We've also seen that retailers typically will purchase machines which have great economies of scale because they can collect a lot in a small space, they can compact, they can manage those containers efficiently. Other not so best in class systems may deploy depots or redemption centers, which are very much manually based systems. They're way more expensive. So net net, we're looking for, as I said, the most effective and efficient way to get to 90 plus percent. And that can be done through return to retail. And that pain point is essentially the argument that introducing deposit return systems will decrease sales, plain and simple. How do you respond to that? Well, the first thing that we have to understand is that deposits is not a price increase. When you're charging a deposit on something, you're effectively taking, let's say ten, the deposit is 10 cents. You're effectively taking 10 cents out of the consumer's hand the first time they go to the shop. But then when they come, and the idea is that they're gonna be spending less. They have less money, cash on hand, to spend on other products or on more beverages. But that article falls, sh that argument falls short because when they come back to the store now they and they return that container assuming they're returning the container now they have an additional 10 cents in their pocket so it's actually a net output in terms of cash on hand of the consumer of zero 
So that, that, that deposit shouldn't have a play in terms of whether or not they're going to reduce their, their consumption of, of sales. Um, the other thing is that, of course, there is always going to be a cost to the system that producers are going to have to pay directly, and they could put that cost in the price. So then the question is, okay, so maybe the price goes up a penny, a half a penny, maybe two pennies. Does that affect sales? So what we did at, at Reloop, and even before Reloop, um, is we looked at jurisdictions that didn't have a deposit, introduced a deposit, to see if there was a change in sales. And what we saw in all of the case studies that we looked at, where there was available data, and we continue to bring case studies as new deposits get introduced, is we analyze whether there was a sales decline as a result of the introduction of the deposit. And what we saw across the board was that there was no change in the, projector, the trajectory of sales, whether they were going up or they were on their way going down. There was no um, disruption to that trajectory in terms of increasing sales or decreasing sales because of the introduction of the deposit. And we looked at different jurisdictions in America, we looked at Europe, we looked in Australia, and we didn't see any impact on sales. Or there was maybe a small impact immediately, but then it stabilized and it went back to normal. So this, this basic, I think it's a myth that deposits will decrease sales. It's based on a lack of understanding, and it's based on a theory of elasticity which really doesn't pertain to deposits, that pertains to a general price increase. You know, I've heard for years people saying that deposit return systems are costly, but they're not. Costly based on what? We're talking about a system that has the ability to recover over 90% top quality material, sorted, ready for closed loop recycling, that can get loop after loop after loop, that is real value for money. You will not, not get that kind of bang for your buck in terms of system efficiency in any other system around the world. And that's why, as I mentioned earlier, the non-alcohol beverage sector in Europe is embracing deposit return. They know it's the only solution for that type of packaging. That's what we're seeing. We're seeing brand owners around the world recognizing we have a real problem with beverage containers, littered, wasted, around the world, and this is a proven solution that works, and it's not that costly. So based on what you're saying, Clarissa, you're, you're, essentially, you're essentially saying that the ground is shifting and that people are turning more and more to deposit return systems, uh, be they best in class or some other iteration. But what about, uh, what about another sector of society who might say that deposits are in fact a tax? Uh, what, do you say, what do you say to this? Well, I would say what I always say, which is if my taxes were like a deposit return program, I'd be very happy because I would get all of my taxes back refunded to me. A deposit is simply a payment that you're going to get back and you can, everybody is able to get it back. So it's a temporary payment. That's all it is and it's a refund and you can get it back. Taxes are very different. You pay your taxes and you don't get them back. That's, there's a couple of certainties in life. Um, death and taxes and deposit return do not fall in that category. We can get them back. They are, should be conveniently deployed so that everybody can get them back, irrespective of where they live, irrespective if they don't have a cell phone, irrespective if they don't have a car or they don't have a bicycle. You should be able to easily get them back. Why are, why are targets so important? What about the deposit level? So first of all, um, targets are important because we need to set a performance standard. We need to be attempting to achieve something. And the targets lay out the framework of what the program is meant to achieve. And then there are usually penalties if those targets are not met. So it keeps the incentive to make the program better and better and make sure that usually industry is running the system to make sure that they run it as efficiently as possible because they've got a target to meet. And when you have a target, you have a monitoring system in place so you can sort of run the numbers every year to make sure that those, those systems are performing as they were set out to perform. The deposit level is the value that's going to truly incentivize people to participate. Now, we've seen systems in America that are really not great. They are kind of failing. They're not even coming close to the kinds of targets that we're achieving in Europe, you know, 90%. And one of the main reasons is because there's a five cents 
incentive to return containers. And a lot of people just don't bother. They'll throw their containers in the garbage. They don't mind losing five cents. But when you increase that refund, it increases the incentive to return it. People don't want to lose 10 cents. In Germany, it's 25 euro cents. In most of the new programs in Western Europe are going to probably be 20 cents. So these are really meaningful refunds that people will actually make the effort to conveniently return their containers, typically to a store, to get those refunds back. If they are not meaningful, they will not participate. They will not care about losing them. And then it will be a tax because they won't get them back and they will be gone, they will be lost. So we very much advocate for a meaningful deposit level and typically, at least in North America, we would like to see at least 10 cents. And in Europe, we would also say at least 10 cents, if not more, depending where in Europe it is, because obviously the socioeconomic condition of that country is gonna play in. 10 cents may be very valuable in the global south or or five cents may be valuable in the global south, but a 10 cent may not be valuable, say, in Scandinavia or some of the wealthier countries. So we have to think about the value of the deposit, but it always has to be meaningful to incentivize the vast majority of consumers to participate. Everybody should want to get their deposit back, and they should want to get it back in a really easy way. There should be no additional transportation required, not a lot of time. It should be the kind of thing that they do when they're going shopping. They can just return their container. It needs to be easy and accessible, and that deposit level has to be high enough to incentivize return. Another important point which, uh, which many people may wish to see addressed uh, today is the fact that beverage containers have evolved uh, in the past in the past few decades. Uh, we're no longer dealing with one or two types of beverage container. We're dealing with several. Um, so what does this so what does this mean for our best in class deposit return systems? What should we be looking for in that regard? Well, for the most part, we need to make sure that we are using the we are introducing and including the broadest scope of beverage containers that exist in the marketplace, and not just sort of picking on. Typical, the typical one, soft drink and beer, which in some jurisdictions around the world, the deposit return system only covers soft drink and beer. But we have water, a lot of bottled water. We have juices, small containers, big containers of juices. We have milk now that is also consumed on the go and that is problematic. So we need to expand the scope of beverage types and containers in the system. It's not just glass bottles and cans and plastic. It now could also introduce could be, we could be introducing liquid paperboard or tetra pack juice boxes into a system. And we need to introduce all those container types that we didn't introduce before, like wine and spirit containers. They all need to be introduced. So in the more best in class systems that we're seeing around the world, we're seeing them cover the broad scope of containers that all the single use beverage containers are included in the program, not just say the beer and soft drink. And the inclusion of more containers is gonna do a number of things. First of all, it's going to be a great way to make consumers aware of the program and participating because it's going to cover a much greater share of the containers that they have in their lives in terms of at home, away from home, and they're going to know about it. They're going to know that there's a deposit system because it's not just on a specific stream of containers. The other thing it's going to do is it's going to bring greater economies of scale to all of the components of the deposit system, whether it be the machines, whether it be the processing, we're gonna take a larger body of containers to eff effectively finance that infrastructure. So from a cost per container perspective, the cost per container is gonna go down because of economy as a scale. So that's why it's a really good thing. Thank you, Clarissa. And just uh, to follow up, you mentioned that uh, education is an important part of this whole process. If we want to introduce a best-in-class deposit return system into a given country, a given, uh, given jurisdiction, what kinds of initiatives do you think would be very valuable in order to educate the public, the lay public, the educated uh, stakeholders, cities, municipalities? What kind of things would you like to see being put in place? Are there any programs that work? Yeah, there are. So typically when a deposit return system best in class is designed, there is money that is allocated specifically for public awareness. And we've seen some really good examples in some more mature jurisdictions. And again, I'm thinking of Norway, where we have an incredible 
uh, P&E program, promotion of educational program, where we have commercials that are specifically targeted to the group of people where they know they're having some challenges. Typically, 18 to 34 year old males are the ones that are not participating in the deposit programs. Drinking energy drinks are those containers that are typically the ones that are failing to meet targets. So they've designed education and awareness programs specifically focused on that target group. And that is the role of the system operator. That is part of their obligation. And typically in regulation, you will see some funds that are being that are forced to be dedicated to that education piece but again when there are good penalties in place for not meeting the targets it doesn't even matter if you have dedicated funds the operating entity that is working on behalf of the brands is very very keen to deploy those education efforts because they want to meet the target because if they don't meet the target they're paying penalties which is far more costly than it would be to meet the target Larissa, in Reloop's work, you often talk about system integrity when it comes to best-in-class best deposit return systems, but uh, maybe not many of us are familiar with this concept. What do you mean by system integrity? Why is this so important to a best-in-class system? Well, when you're dealing with beverage containers, there are potentially billions and billions of units out there, deposits that have been paid by producers, put into the marketplace. And they want to make sure that the deposits they put in the marketplace are being used to incentivize the return and that everything is being tracked and managed properly and that there is limited to no fraud in the system. So you need a system with integrity. And that effectively means you need standards in place uh, for the equipment that you're using, for the procedures that you're using. You need sec security in place at all stages of the process. You need to make sure that all of the barcodes are centrally managed in terms of um, having a central clearinghouse to manage those barcodes, to make sure that all of the machines that are deployed are knowing what those barcodes are so that they can reimburse the deposit when those containers are introduced into the system. This is all part of that integral integrity system. We need to be able to effectively track the, those containers through the system, make sure that we're not offering refunds on any that are not part of the system, and also being able to provide transparency and feedback to the very producers that are paying for the system. This should be a very open, transparent, and honest system. Producers benefit from that. The system benefits from it. The system will be cheaper and more effective. Thank you very much, Clarissa. I think that answers all our questions and uh, has also busted some myths, I think, at the same time. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us for this latest Innovation Series episode, and we'll see you soon. Thank you very much. You're welcome.